He's our good buddy, Ross Tucker, former NFL offensive lineman. Great appearance last week. By the way, Ross will be handling the AFC title game duties. Duties. Uh, that'll be at Arrowhead. Well, that's not the AFC title game. Fritzy. It's the division. AFC title game? Uh-oh. Yes. Oh, that's a COVID-related mistake. Can I, can I blame it on, Wait, on COVID? Wait, you're blaming it on COVID? I think I may have to. I'm a little, COVID fog? A little brain fog. Oh. Have you had COVID for a decade? Wow. <laughs> I think it would be the NFC divisional playoff. It's the AFC. We... It's You even screwed that up. It's not the NFC. It, he's, he's covering the Bills and the Chiefs. I need a nap or something. It's the AFC Divisional Playoff. Oh, I, I put title game there? Yes. Ross will That's be handling horrible, the AFC title game. Mistake. Yeah. Let's bring in Ross Tucker. Clean up the mess here if you can, Ross. You, you're going to be covering the Chiefs' bills at Arrowhead this weekend, right? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's what makes this even better. I'm I'm in the uh, I'm in the booth in Tampa. I I got the Rams and the Bucks. It's the NFC I, divisional round. I may have I texted the wrong Fritzy sheet, I about that twice. I emailed him three times. I even told him <laughs> that this story that I'm a, I'm in the booth and Mike Golick, a seniors on the sideline, oh which is God. so cool for me, Dan, because I grew up outside of Philly and literally uh, when Golick was playing for the Eagles, they came to Kutztown University and did like a charity basketball game or something. So I was in fifth grade. It's like 1990. I get there super early with my buddy and I don't know who was handling it. It was Clyde Simmons, uh, Mike Golick, Andre Waters, and whoever their handler was looked at me and my buddy and said, Hey, we need ball boys. You guys want to be our ball boys? We were like, Heck yeah. So we were in the locker room. Meanwhile, they started to get so tired during the game playing against these teachers. They actually put us in the game and I drained two shots in front of like 5,000 people. So anyway, long story, but I got Golik's autograph. He was awesome that day. I was 11 years old and now I'll be part of a broadcast with him. Even though Fritzy got it wrong three different ways, I'll be part of a broadcast with him on Sunday. Okay, that's a nice story, but let me go back to Todd. You couldn't have whiffed any more than you did. It, it's the NFC. It's not a title game. And it's, I, think I've been, I think I've been set up to my credit. I have an email that I forwarded to the guys okay. that has something very different than what you just read. Okay. Something was printed from an old one-sheet email okay. or something. Okay. I'm very upset, actually, about this because I, I thought it was blame. on me. Yeah. I have physical evidence to show what I sent was actually Bucks divisional playoff. All right. Thank you, Tom. By the way, Dan, you, you also threw me a loop at the start of the segment because you came back from break and you said – Hall of Famer or not a Hall of Famer? I was like, oh, man, I got very excited. And obviously not as a player. I thought no. you meant like Hall of Fame guest or yes. not, Hall yeah. of Fame media guy. Like, I got very excited. And I realized it was not actually about me. Well, <laughs> you had a great appearance last week when you mentioned that you basically uh, urinated uh, during every game, late in the game, that you'd sit on a towel. And uh, what was the fallout from your urination story last week? Well, uh, one piece, first of all, people loved it. I had several of my buddies around here in Pennsylvania text me like, uh, you pee your pants, uh -huh. like, you know, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. But Dan, Monday night, okay, I'm on the sideline for Rams Cardinals, and I had a back surgery in Buffalo. So, so people know, the worst thing about being a sideline reporter is just standing there for four hours. Like, it's terrible for your back. So during one of the TV timeouts, I sit down on like these luxury boxes the Rams have where you can't actually see the field. It's like below field level. I don't know who pays for these things, but I'm sitting there. By the way, Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are there. An equipment guy with all the NFL stuff on the Cardinals sideline comes over to me, Dan, with one of those Gatorade towels. <laughs> and he hands it to me. I'm like, did I, I'm good. Like, did I do something wrong? He's like, no. I saw you on Dan Patrick this week. I didn't know if you needed this or not. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I'm good. I don't hydrate as much as I did when I was a player. But literally, one of the Cardinals equipment guys came over to me with a Gatorade towel because they heard me with you last week. That's great. We're talking to Ross Tucker. I still think he's working the Rams and the Buccaneers coming up <laughs> this weekend 
in Tampa. Uh, loudest stadium to you is where? So when I played, um, it was to me, it was the RCA dome in terms of indoor. That place was so loud. I guess maybe they might have been pumping in noise. I don't know. But that place, you couldn't even hear yourself think. So that's the cold. And the loudest outdoor place was Arrowhead for sure. Now, Seattle's very loud too, but Arrowhead, and this is actually something, Dan, I've never quite understood. You know how there's been so many new stadiums recently? You know, the Giants got one, and obviously San Francisco got one. I don't understand why these franchises don't mimic the acoustics of Seattle or Kansas City. It's not like the Pacific Northwest or the Midwest people are louder than the Northeast people or whatever. I think they're so concerned with maximizing revenue and club space and suites they don't they don't mimic the same acoustics that's a big advantage man it's honestly dan if the bills were playing the chiefs in buffalo i would pick the bills because that place was loud saturday night i was there those people were going crazy but it's in kansas city takes away the offense's ability to have the snap count advantage they'll have to go silent so i lean kansas it makes a big difference yeah, I, I was wondering about that, too, that there are certain stadiums that there is a true – and that Seattle stadium, I mean, that that's that's loud. that And that almost hurts your ears. Um, I remember being in the RCA Dome, but I was there for the Super Bowl, so it, it was a different ambiance there. I've been to Lambeau. That, that's a great field, but that's a home field advantage for a variety of reasons there. Uh, you have the game with the Rams going into Tampa, and I was – it feels like this is the Rams game for the taking with uh, the offensive line, not healthy with the Buccaneers. You don't have Godwin in there. You don't have Antonio Brown, but it's hard to bet against Tom Brady. Who do you think wins to this game? Totally agree with everything you just said. Uh, the Rams are a healthier team. They've got Cam Akers back six months after his Achilles tear, which is incredible. He looked good Monday night. Uh, they won the battle up front against the Cardinals, both sides of the ball. And you're right. I mean, Jensen's limping around. I I personally don't think Tristan Wirth is going to be able to play. And even his backup, Josh Wells, has a quad injury. Ryan Kerrigan got two sacks on them last week. Now Von Miller, who's got six sacks in his last five games. Yeah. This game is there for the Rams taking. This is a game that they should win. But honestly, Dan, I think it's going to be a close game. I think it's going to be a field goal game in the fourth quarter. And I can't verbally do it. Like, I, I can't say Matthew Stafford's going to beat Tom Brady in a close playoff game in the fourth quarter. I will believe it when I see it. He's more likely to make a critical error. Brady's more likely to get the game winning points. So I'll lean Brady there. But I do think Stafford probably has the most to gain of any quarterback this weekend. You know, we would feel a lot differently about Matthew Stafford if he gets the Rams to a conference championship game, if he wins two playoff games, if he beats Tom Brady on the road in a playoff game. I think he has probably more to gain than anybody else this weekend. Yeah, that was my next question because we know who has the most to lose, and it feels like that's Aaron Rodgers. Yes. Would you say that fair? No, no question it's Aaron Rodgers. And I'll go a step further. It's the Green Bay Packers organization. If, if they lose, I don't see any way that Aaron Rodgers goes back there. I think he's just going to think it's just not going to happen for me here. I'm going to move on. If they go to the Super Bowl or win it, I think there's a much greater likelihood that Rodgers comes back. I think this game tomorrow night is that important for the Packers franchise. And you have the Jimmy Garoppolo situation where it feels like he's auditioning for his next job. A, a win at Lambeau would be huge for him. I mentioned that Joe Burrow, if they would beat the Titans, just elevating him and his status as a top 10, top 8 quarterback in the NFL. Ryan Tannehill's probably not going to get any credit if they win that game. <laughs> right? Probably not. No, you're right. You're right. I mean, they can get to the conference championship. Tannehill, I think at this point, 
probably has to get to a Super Bowl. And I would say the Titans, they are they might be the quietest, least respected number one seed I can remember yeah. in a long time. Yeah. And I, I said this on Twitter at Ross Tucker NFL a couple of weeks ago. I think they're one of the worst number one seeds we've seen. I mean, you look at the point spread, you look at what the Vegas folks would say. They're one of the worst number one seeds we've seen in a long time. But guess what? They win two home games. They're going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Ross Tucker, host of the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, the color analyst in the booth for the Rams Buccaneers with Dave Pash and Mike Golick Sr. coming up Sunday on Westwood One. How did we do with that? Good? That was correct, yes. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, Dan, the Bucs might have the best press box food in the NFL. Uh, they have they have multiple carving stations. They serve <laughs> bananas foster at halftime. So I mentioned how important Saturday night is for the Packers organization. The Bucks organization has the opportunity to end the year number one in the Ross Tucker press box food power rankings, which is probably as significant as anything that will happen this weekend. Wow. That's a bold statement there. Huge. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Uh, the road team that has the best chance to win is Buffalo Bills. I think it's the Bills. Okay. I think they might be the best team right now. I mean, their defense is playing lights out. Josh Allen is incredible. You know, I think we all know what they did Saturday night, Dan. They did that against Bill Belichick. I mean, they had a perfect game against a Bill Belichick coached defense. Seven touchdowns and a kneel down. It's incredibly impressive. Uh, that said, even if they win this game, they still need to win one more, likely at Tennessee, to get to the Super Bowl, which I think they need to do to kind of take that next step. But I think the Bills have a great chance. To win. That game is going to be incredible. Look, I'm I'm loving the rams Bucks game that I'm going to be calling, but I really do think Bills-Chiefs is the game of the weekend because I think more than any other game, I do believe the winner of Bills Chiefs is going to the Super Bowl. Sorry, Titans fans. You can be mad at me again, but I think winner of Bills Chiefs is going to the Super Bowl. I was also curious, since you did play offensive line and you also played center for a little while, the the last seconds of the Cowboys game against the 49ers and the role that the center plays on that play, uh, where where do you stand on the Cowboys trying to pull that off and then spotting the football? Yeah, so first of all, I understand the logic of what they were trying to do. You know, they wanted to get it, Dan, so that they could throw a strike into the end zone as opposed to a lob, right? As opposed to a Hail Mary, they wanted to get close enough, sort of like that fourth and 21 touchdown pass Justin Herbert threw in week 18 against the Raiders. They wanted Dak to be able to put a line drive into the end zone. Gives them more of a chance. So I get that. We were always taught in those situations – it's 16 seconds. So whether it's enough time to spike or enough time for a fast field goal, when it's fourth down, you don't have an opportunity to spike it. You got to run on the field. 16 seconds is the number we were always given. Mike McCarthy says it was 13 seconds. The problem I have with what Mike McCarthy said is he said, we practice it every week. Go back and watch the tape. Noah Brown, the receiver, is just kind of standing around. What you do is you have two choices, right? You personally hand the ball to the umpire or you hand the ball to the center who puts it down so everybody knows where to line up and then the umpire has to touch it, release it, so you can snap it real quick. They really didn't do either one of those. To me, the problem with them cutting it so close, they didn't allow for any variables. Yeah. I mean, what if one of the D linemen accidentally kicked the ball? London Fletcher used to do that all the time. You know, it takes a couple seconds off. Or what if they were smart enough to lay on top of Dak for a second or two? There's just a million things that could go wrong like it did to not be able to get the ball off, which I thought they cut it way too close. Yeah, I don't think they practice that every week. Or if they do, they didn't practice it correctly because they they the margin of error was so, so small. And you can't leave – like. You, you kind of exposed yourself uh, as to this. The clock could run out on this play instead of saying to Dak, only get X number of yards if you're going to do it, because they had two plays called. They had a pass play 
And then I think Dak changed at the line of scrimmage and then took off. Well, they're letting you run for a reason because you have no timeouts and the clock is running. That's what I didn't understand. You have to have a clock in your head that says, I have X number of yards, X number of seconds. Now I need to get down. And I, I just, uh, I, I, there's no way they practice that play every week. And you know what, Dan? My bigger issue to be honest with you, was after the game, both McCarthy and Dak Prescott complained about the officials. Now, I know Dak came out and apologized for saying good for the fans for throwing stuff at the refs, which, by the way, was a good move by Dak. But they still both complained about the refs. And I think the older I get, the more I realize these teams seem to be a reflection of ownership. Like, the the lack of accountability and responsibility. McCarthy says... I thought they would let him play a little bit more. What what play is he talking about? When Randy Gregory just tackles the old lineman for no reason, when uh, Adigi Zua pulls down Alex Mack, when Gallimore had his hands up in – like, they were all legitimate penalties, Dan. Like Most of them were pre-snap. pre-snap. Yeah. They were all legit penalties. So rather than after the game saying, we need to do better with the penalties, there's too many – they complained about the refs. So them passing the buck rather than showing the accountability and responsibility, it's why they have so many penalties in the first place. They're not disciplined. They don't take accountability for their actions. Instead, they blame others. And it's why the Cowboys, I feel like, are the same team every year. Thank you, Ross. We'll be uh, we'll be listening this weekend. The Bucks with Dave Pash and Mike Golick, Rams Buccaneers on Westwood One. And also, you can check him out on social media at Ross Tucker NFL. Thank you, buddy. Safe travels. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. We'll take a break. Play the days up next.